We are in session five of new faculty orientation and uh, the faith integration portion of new faculty orientation. So um, I hope you had a good break and are ready to get back to it. Are, you are back to it, right? We're well back into it and that's good. So let's talk about faith integration a little bit uh, for some, some time together today. Uh, you know we're talking about these eight uh, competencies that seem to be uh, helpful in helping a person get oriented around the overall task of academic faith integration. So today we're going to talk about the methodological competency. Uh, and, and this one is a little bit tricky to talk about because what I believe most deeply is that the most appropriate methodologies are going to come through your discernment of your discipline and your engagement of this over time. It's going to make sense different for an English professor uh, than for a physical therapy professor or psychology professor. And so um, finding our way into that is, of course, an you know, um, ongoing challenge and opportunity. Uh, but what I want to try to do today is introduce you to a, a generic methodology that comes out of our faith tradition in the Wesleyan uh, community and uh, introduce some ways to approach that I think will be helpful and can be tailor-made to your disciplinary uh, particulars. Uh, I'm teaching a class right now in the leadership program uh, related to learning and learning theory and how that relates to leaders. And this is a, a book that I've uh, been working with with my students. Tonight's the last night of class. Glad for that. Uh, but I came across this quote and it, it related to, I think, what we're trying to do here together as new faculty. When a person has really mastered a concept or a skill, he, she can be playful with it. Spontaneity and improvisation are more possible for the competent. And you know this as a person who's got advanced degrees that when you get to a certain point, you can you know, feel comfortable to, to play around in the areas where you've become uh, somewhat of an expert. And I think faith integration and the competencies related to that are the same way, that over time, as we develop these skills, uh, they are going to be, uh, they're going to allow us to, to uh, be unique in how we approach it. So that's my hope in this whole experience. Let me define that methodological competency for you. This is the ability to understand and then determine from a variety of options the most appropriate approaches to achieve discipline-related faith integration goals applied to teaching and scholarship. So a good part of what I'm going to do today is ask us to step back from the classroom and to think about how we approach this uh, as a scholarly endeavor, as a task that academic people do. You're going to hear examples uh, that apply back into the classroom, uh, but I'm going to imagine you and imagine me uh, in the places of preparation, how we go about orienting ourselves uh, to this particular work and the methodology and methodologies that might go into that. So let me get you talking to each other for a few minutes. Uh, would you talk around your table about this for just a few minutes? Is there something in your life for which you have perfected a method? If so, what is it? What is your method? How did you go about learning this method? So just a few minutes, this is an icebreaker. This is a chance to, to say hello again to each other. Something that you've become good at, and how did you get good at it? What strategies did you develop in order to get to that point? If it relates to work, so be it, but if it's underwater basket weaving, all the better, okay? Talk to each other for about four minutes about this. Okay, let me interrupt you. I hate to do that, but uh, let's talk together as a, as a large room. What, uh, what were some of the things you said, heard, about what goes into learning a method effectively. What did you hear people say about that? Practice, Practice trial and error, right? Yeah, it didn't work, it didn't work. Oh, it worked. Yeah, what else? Consistency, staying with it. Attention mm -hmm. to detail. Uh-huh, attention to detail, that's great, yep. Making your own. Okay, personalizing it, making it your own, great. Yeah, yeah, something about from here to here, so it just becomes a part of me getting to that point, yeah. So I like to cook, so um, I like to cook because I like good food, and I realized my wife wasn't, it wasn't her, one of her favorite things, so I had to learn a method. And uh, I got a couple mentors. Uh, one was a cookbook by a woman named Alice Waters. Anybody know Alice Waters? It's a great cookbook. Uh, and it was a cookbook that fit me, right? So that, that was one of those things in terms of personalizing it was helpful. Uh, it had a little different approach. I won't go into that now. This isn't about that. But that helped me to sort of, be, it became intuitive because I found somebody who could connect it with the way I learn and the way I understand. That was helpful. And then the other uh, mentor I have is a guy named Chef John. 
His blog is called foodwishes.com. I, I am promoting that right now. He's great. And the thing I like about Chef John is he's not like a celebrity chef, you know, good looking, muscular, kind of juggling the knives kind of guy. You, you watch his pot. So you don't really see him. You hear him. He's a little bit humorous, kind of quirky. It works for me. And he shows me exactly. So I'm seeing it from his perspective. And that has helped me. But then what I've had to do is the next step, because I find that the Thomas Jefferson macaroni and cheese that I love so much, because I don't like craft box macaroni and cheese, I have to keep going back. But I'm now telling myself, OK, I've watched this thing. I've made this thing enough. In the consistency factor, how can I then like, take ownership of it and really make it my own and go to that next level? So, so methods are valuable, and people to teach us methods are valuable, and watching people do it are, are valuable. Staying at it, making it our own, those are all valuable. But it helps to have something to start with. And so I want to give you something to start with, with faith integration. Not assuming that you haven't already started. I know you're well into this, and you're experimenting things. Trial and error is at work. But I want to give you a method uh, to consider use of, and I'm going to approach it from two different ways. But let me introduce it first. So this is called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. Uh, some of you are familiar with this just because that's a part of your heritage and, and you've seen this before. You've been around APU and heard that term before. Uh, the guy at the bottom, of course, is John Wesley, so he, he gets it named after him. The thing you should know is John Wesley didn't sit down and, and write down my quadrilateral, chapter one. Uh, he just went about doing this. It was his method. And then Albert Utler came along and noticed it and detected that this was the kind of thing that Wesley was uh, about when he was doing theological work. Uh, our own Don Thorson, who's a professor in the School of Theology, longtime professor and currently our faculty moderator, uh, wrote a book. Uh, Connie's going to hand it around to you. Some of you uh, may be interested enough to pick up uh, Don's book. I think it has a new cover these days. But he goes through the elements of the quadrilateral and does a good job of showing how they were rooted in Wesley's work and uh, how Wesley went, uh, went about this task. Now, the thing I'm going to say, here's a punchline, and then I'm going to go through each part, is that Wesley means this to work as a, as a whole. This together is his method. Uh, he was not about using these as parts. Now, I'm going to go and introduce, to you them, introduce them to you as parts, and I think they can be used in a way independently of, of one another. So as you get started in trial and error, you might take a part of the quadrilateral and see what you can do with it, but always keeping in mind, and I'll try to illustrate this for you at the end, how they are meant to work together uh, with one another. Let me, let me illustrate that, that this is not really a strange idea. Even in academics, I think we have a sort of quadrilateral that parallels, in some ways, a Wesley's quadrilateral. We have our, our seminal texts or primary sources the things that you can't teach around, the things that in a particular discipline everybody's going to talk about at one point or another. And so somebody like uh, C. Wright Mills and the work that he's done on, on sociology uh, in the late 50s, uh, a sociologist is going to pay attention to something like this uh, in their work. Uh, then you have uh, disciplinary habits of mind. Uh, we talked about this a little bit last time. Uh, research methodologies. And again, I mentioned this to you a month or so ago, that different disciplines have their ways of approaching the task of reasoning about their discipline. And, uh, and, and it's so, by now, in your career, so intuitive, you hardly can tell that there's any other way to think. But different disciplines are training their uh, progeny, those who are coming up uh, in the ranks, to be able to think in certain kinds of ways. Then there's certain standards or schools of thought that exist out there. We will parallel this with traditions. Uh, there's certain things that have been handed down and told, this is something you need to pay attention to in our field. Oh, guess what? There's another version of this you need to pay. Hey, there's somebody else who's thought about it in another kind of way. And so these are things that have been handed down. We've been told this is the way it is. Maybe debatable. We've been told here's different ways people approach uh, different kinds of ideas and, and, uh, and themes. And then uh, in the real world, people are engaged in learning experiences. They're, they're out there figuring out how to make sense of it. They're in conversation. They're in the clinic. Uh, they're uh, in, field, in the field uh, testing these things. They're in the library. And so all kinds of learning experiences together uh, work together in order to cause the learning to occur. So that's a sort of quadrilateral that relates to the kinds of things that Wesley's interested in communicating with us. Um, we're going to call these authorities. Uh, as theological authorities, they refer to those sources of truth that Christians turn to for guidance. 
So there are some um, who uh, will talk about the theme uh, out of the Reformed heritage of solo scriptura, scripture alone. Uh, John Calvin is one who's known for that idea. But even John Calvin used his reason. John Calvin drew upon the traditions of people who'd come before him. John Calvin made connections with his ideas to the experiences of Christian life. So the idea of solo scriptura, even for those who, who appreciate that idea and the authority of scripture, the primacy of scripture, uh, find their way into using these various kinds of things. So I want to talk about them one at a time. Uh, I'm going to take the most time on scripture, and even this will be introductory and uh, maybe for some of you uh, not unfamiliar in the ways to approach scripture at, at a beginning level, and, and I hope it uh, refreshes you if that would be helpful. Um, I'm going to take less time in reason. I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, I want to make sure you understand what Wesley means and how we can make use of tradition, and then uh, talking about the role of experience as well. So. Uh, for many uh, Christians who haven't been trained in the Bible, um, it can be uh, an interesting challenge to be encouraged to make use of the Bible. And so I like asking in this room for you to think about, you know, how do you feel about this opportunity? Uh, does it make you feel anxious that you're being encouraged to use the, the sacred text of the Christians? Or, or maybe it's motivational for you or exciting uh, for you. Um, there are reasons to have some hesitancy, I will admit and acknowledge that. Uh, the Christian community has not always done well with Scripture, and it has, from time to time throughout history, led to some not so good things. For example, the, the, de the defense of slavery, or to deny women the right to vote, or the persecution of the Jews, or to explain away, uh, explain the spread of AIDS, uh, to argue against the drinking of alcohol. Uh, to defend geocentrism. You know, so, so through history, and maybe even in your own area, you say, yeah, that's, a, that's one that I'm aware of. Uh, the, the most interesting historical example that most are familiar with is how the church told uh, the world that uh, the world was flat, you know, and that, that whole kind of an idea. And Galileo decided that the world revolved around the sun rather than the uh, sun revolving around humans and such. Um, and even good people who we otherwise might trust got caught up in the confusion of this. Look what Martin Luther said. He says, people give ear to an upstart astrologer, speaking of Galileo, who strove to show that earth revolves not the heavens or the firmaments, the sun and the moon. Whoever wishes to appear clever may devise some new system, which of all systems, of course, is the best. The fool wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy. But sacred scripture tells us that Joshua commanded the sun to stand still, not the earth. So even Luther, in his interpretation based on the, what he had received, um, was caught up into that uh, misunderstanding. So let me say a couple of things to you about scripture that, that are, are big ideas, but I hope will help you in the kind of work that you'll do. Uh, one thing I want to say as, at a start is to think about the Bible as one story that yes, there's 66 books, and yes, there is uh, a myriad of authors and numerous genres uh, that, uh, f that unpack the, the literature of scripture, and all of that needs to be considered and, uh, and a part of our work. But if we see it as a narrative and as a story uh, from beginning to somehow the end, and the different things that God is at work doing in there, then we can ask ourselves, well, how do we connect with this larger narrative? Alistair McGrath, uh, the, the, the philosopher of virtue, uh, talks about how you can't know where you are until the, you know the story that you're a part of. And, and this is a part of our story. Now, you know, and I hope you, you're uh, embedded in the story of your discipline, but this is the even bigger story. So how does the story of your discipline fit into the story of uh, God at work in the world? Uh, one unpacking of this that uh, comes from... Uh, N.T. Wright, uh, adapted a little bit from his work, you may be familiar with Professor Wright um, out of England, uh, puts the story into six acts. And so you'll see, this is familiar to you. This is, of course, captured in the, uh, the narrative uh, works that unfold from beginning to end. But, but we have a beginning. Uh, it all got started somehow. And there's the attempts of the uh, early collection to, to provide some opportunity to help, that, help us to understand the essence of that, that part of the story. A very small part of the story, but of course crucial, is the fall uh, to sin. 
uh, the, the Adam and Eve story captures that. And, and this is, I think, really important for our work because we practice our disciplines because there's something wrong in the world. The reason we do what we do is because we're trying to clarify certain things that may have gone wrong. Um, and so the story of the fall and the uh, unpacking that thoughtful Christians have done about that uh, part of the story are, are really important to us and may be a big theme for you uh, as you make sense of your faith integration work. Then there's the, the really the rest of the Old Testament where God has a relationship with his people. Uh, he calls them out. He calls them to mission. He calls them to be uh, unique exemplars in the world and to be people who would uh, be uh, embodiments of his better way to live. They succeeded and failed and failed and failed and succeeded a little bit and mostly failed in the story of, of trying to live out that covenant relationship with God. And then Jesus comes, uh, the ideal man, uh, the God man arrives and uh, his life, his teachings, his atoning work, his resurrection, all of what makes up the incarnation is, uh, is so important and, and gives us validity to God stepping into a human story and, uh, and, and that aspect of it. Uh, we're in this stage right now, the stage of mission. Some people call it the church, the stage when we're called to be, exist in the world again as uh, exemplars and storytellers of God's good news. Um, and this uh, invites us to, to make disciples of the nations and to be influencers uh, across the globe. And the, the story uh, has a kind of culmination too. Uh, and of course, different people make sense of this in all kinds of different ways, and that's part of the fun of studying the Bible, but recognizing that this, the history has a culmination in the way that the story unpacks itself. So if you grab hold of these big ideas and notice how they are manifested in the biblical narrative, they can be helpful for you to make connections to the work that you're doing in faith integration. So I'm going to ask Connie to pass around this book. Um, I found this very helpful to recommend to faculty because what I just shared with you in four minutes, uh, here's a book length um, description of, uh, of, these, of these acts and a biblical unpacking of it. And it will bring your familiarity with scripture to life in a new way. And you'll see some connections that I think you would really appreciate that as well. So let's go from the big to the small, okay? And uh, I'm going to share what I've got for you. And on the way out, Todd can correct me and uh, bring you some further, further insight from his work. But I think it's important that we have a, a, a basic understanding of how to approach texts, uh, call them paragraphs, or ideas that are held together um, in, in literary kinds of ways. So let me give you... Um, a metaphor of that from the, the way we approach uh, maybe a class assignment or a set of assignments, and then I'm going to translate that into a way to approach uh, looking at scripture. At the very beginning, and I, I think I introduced some of these ideas to you uh, before, I'm, I'm applying it in a different way. Um, you know, you want students to grab hold of certain basic kinds of facts and, and data that by the time they get to the midterm, you feel confident that they, in passing a midterm exam, can have a sense of the material that you've been working with and will be working with maybe more deeply in the second half of the semester, right? So you get to a certain point where you assign a midterm, do they have the knowledge that allows, will allow them and us to advance together? Uh, down the line a little bit, then you might want to assign an essay. Uh, they're going to do some actual creative writing where they're going to take a theme and they're going to draw together certain threads of thought and, and synthesize them to reflect, okay, I have more than the knowledge of what's there. I can actually put this together in a meaningful kind of way. In the end, what we might want to do is, is ask them with a group of other students to engage in dialogue and to produce a kind of project to get something in place that can be presented, that can undergo a more robust critique that, that offers meaningful application for their own uh, effort and study and for the, those that they'll be presenting to. So this is a sort of movement from knowledge to deeper understanding to, to deeper wisdom. I think if we look at the Bible and texts in the Bible in that way, uh, that can be a helpful flow of thought. So taking the time to just get what is there in terms of the literature that's in front of you. So this is where you're going to want to introduce yourself, if you haven't met, to some uh, thoughtful uh, biblical commentaries, uh, maybe some studies in culture, uh, some of the history of, of the background of, of a passage that you might be uh, attempting to make some sense of. 
Just get your mind around how did those who might have read this first, how might them have understood the things that are coming across in a basic knowledge kind of way. Do your homework. Get a sense of what's there. As you do that, you'll find yourself beginning to make greater sense of it. Uh, you'll have some deeper understanding. You'll find that principles will emerge and, and, and clarifying your, uh, your ideas for, uh, for being able to discern the, the way this might be uh, uh, important and valid for the people who first read it and maybe for us. Uh, we want to always avoid being presumptuous that our interpretations are for everyone, everywhere, every time. But, but you can still get a sense of the eternalness uh, in a passage. And so seeking to, to uh, unpack it in that kind of way, beyond just I did my homework, I've got all the knowledge, I've got everything piled up, but I've made sense of it. And then wisdom is the sense of being able to apply it with some confidence, being able to make connections to, in our case, the, the work we're doing in, in the academic context uh, in a meaningful way. Uh, appropriately applying uh, principles to the work and ideas that we're working with today. So let me give you another metaphor on that, just an illustration of that. Uh, if you're a rock collector, well, you got to get out there and just get the rocks all piled up. Just get them all in one place. Just grab them and throw them into the pile. Uh, that would be kind of the gathering of the knowledge. Then move to understanding. Well, how do these things order themselves? Uh, how do they... Uh, find themselves with things that are like them and distinguish themselves a bit from things that are different from them in terms of I've really come to understand the passage and what's here and, and the ideas that are beginning to flow out of it. And, th and then create something. Uh, what emerges in your imagination and in the application of that uh, that can make something beautiful in, in the world of ideas and in the connections that you might want to make uh, to your work. So I don't know if you guys know Andy Goldsworthy, the artist. Anybody familiar with Andy Goldsworthy? Look up Andy Goldsworthy sometime when you're like needing to be encouraged with beautiful things. He's an artist who works just with what's there in, in nature. And so here's some of his walls. And uh, out there gets commissioned and uh, shows up and does these amazing kinds of things. So type his name into your Google search engine, not now, some other time. And I, I think you'll be encouraged by that. Uh, so the, so the, when it comes to faith integration then, it's this toggling that we do between the area of knowledge that we love and are committed to and know and have studied and biblical knowledge. And we want to understand deeper the field that we're engaged with. And then how does that come into conversation with, with faith-based understanding? And we want to keep working in our field to greater application and creation of new ideas, applying our imagination. But how does that work itself out as godly wisdom? So this constant... Um, uh, dual listening, as John Stott calls it, this attending to both and the way they interact with each other in the scripture uh, is a part of our particular work. So uh, one other book I'll mention to you now, I don't have it here to pass around, but is uh, also co-authored by Don Thorson and another uh, professor from our biblical studies department, Keith Reeves. Uh, they wrote this book uh, with college students in mind, and I hope that doesn't push it away from you. I hope that encourages you that this is a good primer on making sense of the Bible in a meaningful way. Lots of good chapters, and I think you would enjoy this. So I want you to talk to each other for a minute here. Um, I'm putting some questions up here. You can talk about it however you like, okay? These are meant to be prompts. You can talk about it however you like. In what ways have you used the Bible in the task of academic faith integration? Are you satisfied with your use of Scripture? What are some next steps that you would like to take? What themes in your work as a teacher-scholar do you suspect may have input from the Bible? And how can you further develop your knowledge of God's word in a way that forms for you a well-developed well Christian imagination, okay? So talk about that for about five minutes, and then I'll interrupt you with the next part of the quadrilateral. Let me say one more thing about scripture uh, as we transition to reason. Uh, that we talk about the importance of scripture does not obligate you to bring scripture into your class um, all the time or maybe ever. So remember, I'm imagining you in your preparation. And in your preparation, I think this is going to be an important part of your work. But faith integration does not put a demand on you to feel like you have to bring the Bible into your classroom. Because you're developing your Christian imagination around the Bible and your discipline, it will appear in different kinds of ways that might not look like a chapter and a verse. Okay, So this is an encouragement to you in your work. Yes, it may appear in your class. I hope from time to time it will seem appropriate to do that.
but that's not the goal. Okay, so I, I want to make sure that you have a sense of that. And, and that's one of the great things about having uh, a university where students, uh, our undergraduates in particular, uh, take Bible classes because they're, they're, they're getting a lot of that. And they come into the rest of our classes with some orientation to that. So we can be in cahoots and relationship and uh, collegial partnership with uh, our faculty friends across campus. Okay? So I'm going to take just a little time on this idea of reason. And the reason for that is because we've already done some of the work that I might otherwise do here uh, in talking about the competencies. In particular, when we talked uh, last time uh, here in this room about the intellectual competency, um, we recognized that there is something that uniquely happens in a university classroom where people are called together to think. And it may be about a practical area, but they're called to read. They're called to appreciate knowledge and to grapple with that knowledge and to make sense of it uh, in the field of study that they're interested in or with the uh, area that they're learning to practice. Um, because as Christians, we have a unique appreciation for how God made our minds and the fact that uh, this is a God-given capacity, we go beyond the uh, enlightenment limited perspective that it, it's all about what happens between my ears and that's, that's the whole story. Uh, we can appreciate the kinds of um, commitment to thinking that emerged there, but we don't want to have that arrogant uh, perspective that says uh, we can arrive uh, independent of conversation with God and conversation with others and recognition, humble recognition uh, of this being a gift from God um, that uh, might otherwise have emerged from the modern era. And I, I think a lot of the postmodern conversation is leaving that sort of uh, limited idea behind and yet we bring a new perspective. So when we come into our classrooms, and again, this is what we did last month, we, talk, we talked about different ways that we can use faith integration uh, for intellectual development uh, with our students. Uh, that may involve intellectual virtues, uh, helping them to learn to appreciate certain authorities, uh, recognizing the role of faith integration related to those disciplinary habits or methods of mind, uh, how faith integration and critical thinking come together, and the disciplines involved in study. We talked about reading being one place where faith integration has an opportunity. Um, the other connection I'll make to reason here uh, is in this idea of the, uh, of the disciplinary connection. Because w Wesley, for example, uh, approached reason not just that he appreciated God gave him a mind and he wanted to use his mind to think well, but that God had given other people ideas as well and that he wanted to draw on them. So while not always because the times were when they were a couple hundred years ago, um, he didn't have all the best knowledge that we have today. And of course, 200 years from now, people will have more knowledge than we have today. But Wesley was interested in a broad area of subjects, for example, medicine. Wesley studied the medical literature of his day and paid attention to the most up-to-date, thoughtful thinkers on medicine. And he wanted to do some work on making sense of that from a Christian faith perspective. So Wesley says, to imagine that none can teach you but those who are themselves saved from sin is a very great and dangerous mistake. Give not place to it for a moment. So part of the idea of reason here that, that we'll emphasize is that your discipline has provided you with reasonable thinking from a lot of reasonable people, and that needs to be brought into the conversation as well. Uh, use your mind and appreciate and access the minds of others uh, in that which they have produced uh, in the scholarly tradition. Okay, so let's move to tradition, uh, a little bit of an elusive idea, and I want to see if we can make sense of it. Um, that word tradition gets different kinds of reactions from people, especially uh, in um, uh, academics. I remember one time uh, in early, my early career here, one of my supervisors, I won't say which one up the, up the, up the chain, um, notice that I didn't have, all of my books were less than, I think there weren't any, how do, how do I want to say this? I, I didn't have any that were younger than five years old or something like that, right? So if I said that right, you get what I'm saying. The principle of if it's newer, it's better, right? And the more recent knowledge is the knowledge that matters. Um, I shared that with my friend Steve Wilkins, and he says, well, I'm in big trouble because my authors are people like Aristotle and Socrates and Plato, and they're way old, you know, and yet some people think that you have a hard time improving on some of these people. So tradition often gets uh, dissed. Um, even the Reformation was concerned that tradition had obscured the gospel. Uh, the Enlightenment 
folks said tradition ties us to a superstitious past. We need to get past all that in, in, into some more scientific ways of understanding the world. Even in our own country, we were about escaping the bondage of, of the English tradition. Uh, but I want to encourage you, and Wesley does as well, to appreciate the value of things that are old and things that have come before us. So Yaroslav Pelikan uh, says, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And I suppose I should add, it is traditionalism that gives tradition such a bad name. So tradition is something to really appreciate. Uh, G.K. Chesterton talks about tradition as as the democracy of the living and the dead. Because not just those who are alive have a chance to give a voice to things, but those who have come before us have a chance to have a voice. Tradition actually helps us to find the necessary resources to wrestle with contemporary situations. How do we make sense of what we're facing today? Well, we ask, how did people in the past struggle with similar kinds of things? And our discipline have all of these things that, again, we've inherited. They're traditions uh, in our work as academics that we draw on. So traditions have value. In terms of Christian faith tradition, uh, this is the recognition that the Holy Spirit has been faithful at continuing to uh, uh, support in God's people over time uh, the passing on of the gospel message and of the message of the scriptures. We have this great cloud of witnesses who have received and then passed on, received and passed on, received and passed on uh, the insights given to them by the early uh, teachers, prophets, apostles and others, and, uh, and we're grateful for that. That's a part of what sustains us and reminds us that God is at work. What does tradition do? Well, among other things, it plays a normative role. It tells us what we should do. Now, you can disagree with that, but certain things at certain points in history were decided that they, this is what should be done. Whether it be in Acts chapter 15 or the Council of Nicaea, certain standards were set, certain uh, ways of identifying the ethos of the Christian community were, were identified and clarified and codified. And so these give us a sort of base to stand on and to respond to. Now, all throughout time, people have been responding to those traditions. They've been uh, interacting with them, trying to uh, appreciate their value and wonder in a new world whether they need to be adjusted. But they give us something to appreciate. Stanley Hauerwas says that the traditions of the church that are encapsulated in the Christian story are the bearers, this is a great phrase, the bearers of rationality and innovation. They tell us about how these people use their minds to make sense of their struggles and to come up with new ways to respond. And so when we look at that and grab hold of that and struggle with their approach to things in our new situations, it gives us a great kind of heritage. So what can you do to grow in your knowledge of tradition? Let me give you a few suggestions here. Uh, one is to uh, pick up a book like Alistair McGrath's where he talks about 10 uh, Christian thinkers from the past. If you want to just to begin to expose yourself at a beginning level, this is a short book, short chapters, who in the heck was Augustine of Hippo and why does he matter to me? Well, he may not, but he may. He may actually surprise you with some things that he has to say or John Calvin or C.S. Lewis. So this is one place to do that. Another couple of books I want to tell you about um, Connie, hand that one around, Theological Aesthetics. So for my uh, friends in the College of Music, Music and the Arts, this is a book I recommend to them because what it does is it, it has short readings from the last 2,000 years from people who've been thinking about beauty and artistry and craftsmanship and music and art, all the things related to aesthetics. And it tells us that we're not the first people to begin thinking about these things. So to draw upon and to respond to and to interact with, in that book, you're going to find people who say, Christians have no place in the theater. Anything that creates an image is uh, against the scripture, and it should not be a part of Christian practice. Well, good. Then our, our people who are about art and sculpture get to struggle with how Christians have struggled to a, make sense of these ideas, and they have some of these uh, early writings uh, to pay attention to. The other one that's uh, there, small, a source book in Christian political thought does the same kind of thing from a political perspective. I don't know if there's a book like this in your area, but uh, drawing on the thoughtful input of people from long ago can be a great place to go. Here's a second thing that you can do related to tradition. And so here's another book coming around. How many have seen this book before by, by Richard Foster? 
Uh, so it's not the whole story. It's uh, short summaries of, but you'll, you'll notice the key thing here, streams of Christian tradition. He doesn't call these denominations. He calls them streams because it's where big ideas in Christian faith come together around different groups of people who try to sort out how to follow Christ in light of those commitments. So when I show this to people, I usually uh, find myself again and people I'm talking to identify just looking at those words with, with at least one, maybe two of those streams. As I spend time in a book like this and on the thinkers that are uh, historically behind these ideas, uh, I'm, I'm reminded that I have connections with many of these ideas and that there's some rich wisdom that maybe wasn't a part of my denominational heritage, but that might have something to say to the work that I'm doing uh, in my field. So in my work in leadership, teaching leadership, I draw upon the social justice stream and actually the contemplative stream a fair amount, uh, helping leaders who are otherwise go, 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 busy, 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 do, 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 to learn about contemplation. And so I draw up on that stream. It's not the, the stream of my childhood, but it's a stream I've come to appreciate and draw from uh, in helping leaders to know how to be still and to know God is God and to take time uh, away for solitude and spiritual discipline. Now, I just have to give the caveat because if you're looking at the table of contents, you don't see the scholastic stream in there. Steve Wilkins and I were thinking about this. We thought we, we think Richard Foster left one out the stream that many of us as people in a university uh, have some commitment to, and that is to the, the, the thinking aspect of, of Christian life. And so we added that one. But the streams are another place that you might go. Richard Foster's book uh, is one place to begin. A, a third place to go is your own denomination. And uh, if you don't know this, then you should know that APU is interested in supporting uh, your uh, depth of knowledge and understanding and appreciation for your own denominational heritage. Now, as you go into that, you might find things that surprise you in beautiful ways or not so beautiful ways. Uh, and you might find things that your denomination has to say, your denominational tradition, uh, to the work that you're doing uh, in faith integration. You may not, okay? So this isn't like a guarantee that every denomination has thought deeply about your area. But maybe implicitly, there are some connections that you might make. So this is the kind of, again, toggling that you want to do. You want to think about all the stuff, the traditions of your discipline, but then think about these different aspects of Christian tradition. And might there be some conversation that could unfold between these things that would give you some interesting possibilities? And, and by the way, when you think about the last 2,000 years, and if you want to go further into the Old Testament and, and the heritage we have with the people of God in Israel, uh, are, are there any of these topics that haven't been tackled or taken on? Uh, certainly not, right? It, it's out there. You may have to do a little digging to find a tradition-based connection to what you're doing, but it's there. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is a good metaphor for this uh, is the Talmud. And Todd, maybe you can help me a little bit with this. So is that shalom? That's right. So backwards to forwards, the shh over to the mm, shalom. And so here um, in the Talmud, people started talking about this, this word. And then somebody had something to say to the people who started talking. And they said something, and then somebody else said something else, and then somebody else responded to all of that. The beauty of it is that it's been captured and retained, so the dialogue, the conversation, is available to people who can work in the languages and things for, for a sense of how these ideas developed over time. And, and if we can into the conversations that tradition invites us to around ideas related perhaps to our area. Even if your area is 100 years old, it probably has themes that go back much further. That's just an illustration to, to suggest this idea of ongoing dialogue and conversation uh, that we can be uh, a part of. Uh, the objective of faith integration is not to come up with dogmatic conclusions. You may, that's great, but it's to foster that centered dialogue. Let's get together around the authorities we're committed to, which includes scripture and those in the tradition of our faith who've struggled to understand these things and, and invite conversation to ensue. Okay, so let me get you talking to each other. What role does your discipline's tradition, uh, that is the early theories, theorists, methods, disciplinary assumptions, scope of inquiry, play in your teaching or scholarship? So here's the appreciation of the tradition from your discipline. But then toggle that again with, are there places where Christian tradition addresses a subject matter in your discipline in ways that enrich or challenge it? What aspects of these two traditions can you draw upon to enhance 
or reframe the work you do as a Christian academic. So however it's meaningful you, for you to talk about that, take a few minutes to talk about that before we move to the last one, experience. Okay, let me have you back for our last element here. Let me talk to you about experience for a few minutes. And uh, to start here, you need to understand a little of the background of John Wesley on this. Um, John Wesley coming from the Anglican church, the Anglican church had three things that they were interested in, scripture, reason, and tradition. That he inherited. But one of his innovations in the tradition of the Wesleyan emergence uh, is this idea ex of experience. Because what Wesley saw in the, in the faith community of which he was a part, such a dry, dead orthodoxy, he was passionate about what he called vital piety. He wanted to see people really live into a passionate, loving relationship with God. And so experience comes out over and over again when you read his sermons and his journals as a really important part uh, of, of his understanding of the Christian faith. Uh, subjective, yes, but not, subjectivist, not subjectivistic uh, because it was something that happened personally. But it, it happened because of an encounter, an encounter with God. So he sought to find the, that place of balance between extremes uh, in his own experience. He appreciated rationality, but not to the extreme that it left out uh, um, uh, that piety, that desirous relationship with God. He, he wanted enthusiasm, but not so far that it, it lost the sense of rationality. The validity of the experiences were determined for Wesley by what they accomplished. So did this lead to sanctification? Did this lead to life change? Did this lead to deeper understanding of God and the scripture? See, this was really Wesley's operative question. He wanted to know, are you becoming a better lover? Are you becoming a better lover of God and his people? And is it, is it a holistic thing where, where the experience of walking with God and growing in your relationship with him and in the community of faith is, is changing you entirely? Uh, are you seeing the way the Holy Spirit is at work in the world and in your life in uh, more and more ways? Are you attentive to, to God's work in that? Uh, are you learning to see uh, situations from a spiritual perspective? So he knew that people lived their lives, and he wanted them to see that God was at work in that, not just uh, at the class meetings or, or, the, or the Sunday morning gatherings, but he wanted to see that over time, the eyes of their hearts were being enlightened. They could see what was happening in them and in others and in history, on clearer and clearer and clearer ways. So in a way, in this, I think of the teacher like we understand the role of the spiritual director. Spiritual directors are becoming more popular in the Protestant church. They come uh, mainly out of the, the Catholic contemplative tradition, but Eugene Peterson has some great ways of, of, of illustrating here, I think, what we get to do as teachers. He says, searching through indexes to find the page where a certain subject is presented is not the same as having a person notice and name the truth that I'm grappling with right now in my life. In spiritual direction, I am guided to attend to my uniqueness in the larger context of spirituality and to discern more precisely where my faith development fits in. Our primary task is to be a pilgrim. So we get to be these people who help point things out as students are making the connections that emerge between faith and their life and the topic that we're engaged in, in studying together, we get to help them as pilgrims to make sense of these things. It makes me think, of course, of the Pilgrim's Progress book and the encounter uh, that Christian had when he stopped by Interpreter's house. And after Interpreter took him to see many excellent things, things needful for his journey of faith, here's what Pilgrim says as he departs, here I have seen things rare and profitable, things pleasant, dreadful, things to make me stable in what I have begun to take in hand. Then let me think on them and understand. Wherefore they showed me were and let me be thankful, O good interpreter to thee. So we get to be the people who point to things and make sense of things and help deepen understanding of things as our students are with us. Back to Peterson. He says, a Christian's need for personal spiritual director cannot be delegated to books or tapes or videos. Sure, we use those things, right? Maybe not videos these days quite as much as when he wrote that, but we use those materials. The very nature of the life of faith requires the personal and the immediate. 
If we are going to mature, we need not only the wisdom of truth, but someone to understand us in relation to this truth. Now, this is something I think that begins in our own work, again, behind the scenes, as we're attentive to the experiences of our practice and the experiences of our study and the experiences of, the stu of what students will face as they leave our classes. We're thinking about those things. But then when they come into our classes, this is where we're kind of on the spot in, a, in an exciting way, prepared to do this kind of work with them. I think this is, it involves naming, naming course-related realities using faith-based language and concepts. So a historian might want to talk about themes in Christian theology like sovereignty and providence. A social worker might want to use the word compassion for talking about the virtue that is involved in the, the, the work of a social worker. A person involved in teacher education might draw up on the, the idea of hospitality to talk about what they're trying to do. To connect course themes and content to life situations via faith-based reflection questions. So can we ask students the kind of questions that help them to say, okay, when we read that book and we then experienced that reality with people that we're trying to understand how to reach, perhaps in a hospital or in a classroom, or, or people who are paying attention to literature, how do those things come together? How do they connect with each other? We're the ones who get to make those connections or help students to make those connections. To challenge students to make sub subject-inspired change based on faith-oriented motivations. So something you do because it's your job to teach might inspire them to want to be a certain kind of person. Well, how can you tie that to becoming a better lover in the way that Wesley might want it to go deeper uh, than just because the subject is inspiring? How can we link profession or discipline-based practices to faith-based practices? How can we tie theories and thoughts to human desires so that desires are informed by truth and, and ultimate truth? This is the kind of pointing and naming and connecting that we can do with the experiences uh, that are a part of the subject that we teach. Okay, I'm not going to give you time now to discuss that. I wish I could, but I want to draw this together. So I'm going to do this visually, all right, rather than on a slide. Because different ones of us, I'm going to do this a couple of ways, because different ones of us have different starting points. So let's start with people who are uh, in uh, a, a traditional discipline where there's literature out the wazoo and there's lots of uh, content, okay? So they can start, people like that can start with reason, okay? So I'm already reading and studying and thinking about the things that people in my world are thinking about. I'm engaged in the literature and I start there like any teacher, any place would. That's the beginning point for some of us, the reason side, the, the thoughts and thinking of the people who I share a knowledge commitment with and a passion to pass that on. Well, then you can do one of two things. You can say, okay, as a Christian, I want to invite other conversation partners. I might go directly to scripture. Scripture might have a connection that could allow the literature of my discipline, the reason that has been entrusted to me, and the literature of the faith, the Christian scripture, to come into conversation with each other. Or you might do the same thing with tradition. There might be a thoughtful person, St. Augustine of Hippo, or somebody out there who's long before you, or your own denominational heritage, or one of these streams, and there might be something in that of course, that's linked to Scripture, at least from the perspective of those who practice it. But there might be something that you draw on from that to come into conversation with the thinking of those in your discipline. So eventually, you've got, you've got those things working in your mind, and you're making the connections, and you're seeing things. And that then results in some opportunities related to experience. Because if all you want for this to be is head knowledge and pass the test, fine. But I think you want more than that. I think you're interested in what you're passing on to your students to be transformative in some way in terms of the career or, or specialty or study that they're interested in, but also in terms of faith. So how does that then move to helping open their minds to how this might be transformational in their life outside the classroom? So that's a way that might begin here. On the other hand, for people in practice disciplines, and that's a number of you here, you might start with the experience side of things. You might use, instead of the word experience there, you might say the situations that people who are moving into this field will find themselves in. Or you might say the practices that they will engage in that everybody in that profession has to do. 
And then you look at that practice, you look at that experience, you look at that situation, and you really seek to understand it on a deeper level. And then what do you do is you might go into one of these other directions. Maybe reason is first. You say, you know what, as I think about that, there's other scholars who've tried to make sense of that practice too. So you might look at the literature that tries to explain or improve or elucidate that practice. But then you move to scripture and tradition. And you say, is there something in Christian tradition that would inform that practice? Maybe there's a practice or a virtue in faith that can bring that practice or that situation to light in a new way that can help us understand it, that can help us see how we can live into it in a more robustly faith-centered kind of way? Is there scripture that would then also support that and maybe challenge the research or support the research in different kinds of ways? So this is not meant, this quadrilateral, to be a one, two, three, four every time. This is where you tailor make it around things you're interested in and things you're working at and things that you find yourself discovering as a starting point and then building from there. Okay, um, the quadrilateral uh, uh, can be used uh, in each of those individually, and I think there's, that there's validity to that. But over time, and we talked about how you develop a, a competency in a method, you know, you, you, you watch yourself, you reflect on this, you stay at it, you try new things, some trial and error, and eventually it becomes a part of, I think, your conversation, the way you approach it. Um, so some people have done this, what I just described for you, with their students over a semester. Go out and study this situation and pay attention to it. They come back two or three weeks later. They talk about the situation. Here's some theme of some writing from Christian tradition. Let's bring that into the conversation and reflect on that. How about discovering some scriptures that can inform that? And oh, by the way, there's some thoughtful people in our discipline who are trying to make sense of that too. And bringing those pieces together can help your students to unpack this. The last thing I'll say, and then it's time to go, is that uh, what I just did for you just now in about four minutes, uh, we, we are doing a, a faculty learning community this year, the whole year, uh, learning to do that together. Uh, Paul Schreier and I from the School of Theology have been leading that, and I, I expect we're going to offer that again uh, next year. So if this little thing and this introduction that I've given you inspires you to say, yeah, I'd like to figure out how to do more of that, we, we're going deep in that. Uh, over the course of the year with a group of folks right now, and, and maybe that'd be something you'd like to do, okay? So I'll just remind you to uh, keep gathering things for that portfolio that I'm encouraging you to collect uh, in your first year here. Uh, whatever kinds of things that are working or you're trying or articles or experiments or assignments uh, that you can kind of pile into an online folder, and then uh, we'll share some of that with each other in our last gathering together, okay? Thanks for being here. Have a great afternoon.